All right, we are going to continue our study of the book of Revelation for Bible-believing Christians. Um, if you're not a King James Bible believer, you need to be. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit will get you to that uh, position eventually. But uh, we're going through the book of Revelation. I always say this at the beginning of the studies. And seeing what we can glean as Christians for today. In other words, for instruction and righteousness. Because most of the events of Revelation are happening in the future time of Jacob's trouble happening to the Jewish people, uh, to the nation of Israel, uh, not to the body of Christ. But so we're going to go through this, Revelation chapter 21, because here we are back in the picture again as uh, glorified saints, and uh, this is where we get into eternity. I remember hearing a story years ago, a preacher I used to know, and he went to a retirement home, and there was an elderly woman there, and, and uh, he said about, you know, would you like to do some Bible studies? And she, oh yes, you know. And, and he said, how about the book of Revelation? And she went, oh no, it's too scary. I, I don't want to hear anything from the book of Revelation. And he said, um, have you ever read it? Oh my, no. I, I looked at it a little bit and I, I don't want to read it. I don't want to hear anything. He said, let me just read a little bit of the last two chapters. And he started reading Revelation chapter 21 and Revelation chapter 22. And, and her attitude changed. Okay. Uh, the two greatest, most uh, amazing promises um, chapters I should say that give the most amazing promises for the future are Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 that's where we read about eternity best two chapters in the Bible in terms of what we have coming what we have to look forward to so let's start here Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea now, when did that happen? Uh, when did the first earth burn up? Uh, Re Revelation chapter 20, verse 9, look just right over there, it says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So that's when the first earth is burned up. That's when it's, um, you know, destroyed, essentially. And, of course, you read verse 11 there. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So that's when it's happening. Revelation chapter 20, at the end of the millennial kingdom, is when the earth and the heavens and the earth pass away. All right, And uh, the Lord creates a new heaven and a new earth. In uh, chapter 21, go over to 2 Peter chapter 3. A great challenge here. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. Okay, it says here, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The day of the Lord there encompasses the second coming. It starts with the second coming and goes the whole way through to the end of the millennial kingdom when Satan is loosed out of, bot out of the bottomless pit. And, you know, the events of Revelation chapter 20, verse 9, happen at that point. That's what the day of the Lord is. It starts with the second coming, thousand-year kingdom, and the destruction of the heaven and, or, you know, the, the heavens and the earth. That's what happens there. But look at verse 11, here in Second Peter chapter 3. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Hmm. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's a perfect introduction right there to the book of Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 is the new heaven and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. We're going to see that as we go through this chapter. But there's the challenge. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? You see all this? It's all going to be dissolved. The vehicles that I own, dissolved. This house, dissolved. All the palaces and riches and wealth of this world, dissolved, burned up. Oh, did you, Brother Brian, did you see the new Camaro that they're coming out? Dissolved. Oh, you got to see this new airplane that, Dissolved. Have you ever been to such and such vacation resort? Dissolved. You see what I'm saying? That's why the Bible says that we're not to set our affection on things on this earth. Set your affections on things above, in heaven. 
And let's look about how to, what it's going to be like up there and why we should set our affections on those things above. Go back to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. I mean, it's the most amazing, amazing description of a place where we're going to be for all of eternity. It's incredible as Christians. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. And I, John, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. How can the bride of Christ be as a city? Hmm. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. doesn't make sense you got a bride and she's a city how does that work Ephesians chapter 2 verses 20 through 21 sorry 19 through 22 I was looking down here what I have highlighted 19 through 22 now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Hmm. Rather interesting. You say, could you illustrate it? Sure. This is the benefit of being a father of a young child. Here we go. What do we have here? Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Okay. Jesus is the rock of our salvation, not Peter. Sorry, Catholics. Here's the foundation, Jesus Christ. Here you have a Christian get saved. They click into Jesus Christ. Another Christian gets saved. They click in. Another one. Another one. And you can keep building on top of there. I didn't want to bring up more Legos because I'd probably end up getting distracted, but uh, I think you see the point. You see, Christians are like building blocks. We click together and we rest on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And you see, when this whole building is done and you get all the Legos built up, guess what? Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone and he's up on the top as well. And the whole thing is the body of Christ. You see how that works? So the bride can be the body. Can be both the same there. A lot of people don't understand that. They go, well, it doesn't make sense and things. Well, these two are one flesh, you see. You can be the bride and the body of Christ at the same time. All right? That's how the thing is going to work. So Jesus Christ is going to be, the city is going to be basically encompass the Lord somehow, and we as the body of Christ are going to be clicking together, making that thing. Really kind of an interesting thing there. Looking forward to that. Go back to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Hmm. Um, wait a second. I, uh, wouldn't there be like some kind of a pure gold church building that we all go to on Sunday and worship or the Sabbath day or something like that? No. Even in heaven, it says there, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So you see, this teaching that a lot of the brethren seem to cling to, that, well, they didn't have church buildings in the first century because they just didn't have the money, you know, they didn't have the support for it yet, but it kind of came later and now God's cool with it. No, I don't think so. You see, because it's not there in the first century, it's not there in eternity. Kind of an issue. I mean, oh, well, you know, brother, there's nothing, you know, it's, it's, you're arguing from a position of silence when you're against the, the church buildings because the, the Bible doesn't... I get this stuff all the time with people. It's just insane. But uh, trying to find the scripture here very quickly. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
Verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Christians meeting together, that's the temple of God. See? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Oh no, you, you're not in church, if you're not in a church building. Um, I'm connected to Jesus Christ, aren't I? I have fellowship with other Christians, don't I? That I'm in church. Well, Brian Denlinger teaches people shouldn't go to church. Uh, well, the Bible doesn't say go to church. You know, and I find it so ironic that God, in the in the absence of evil, and He's got it all sorted out, New Jerusalem, the Holy City, everything, perfect opportunity to make the most elaborate, most gorgeous church building temple, tabernacle, whatever he wants to, the most perfect opportunity for it. Nobody's going to enter into the thing that's an infiltrator or corrupt or whatever else. Perfect chance for a church building, and he doesn't build one. And he just says, oh, I'm with my people there with me. The tabernacle of God is with men. We're all together. Still got to hold on to it there, don't you? Some of you out there. It's insane. Verse 4. Here's a good one. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the th former things are passed away. Are you looking forward to no more crying? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, But here's a little bit of a challenge. Again, a lot of challenges in this chapter because there's some really good stuff. <laughs> um, notice when the tears are wiped away. After the great white throne judgment. Oh, we're, we're going to be glorified saints up there in heaven. We aren't going to have, have any emotions or anything. Oh, uh, yeah, we will. Um, we're going to get to see a lot of lost people and uh, that we knew. And we're going to see those lost people, and we're going to say, you, I tried to witness to you, you I should have probably, and I didn't, whatever else. Um, it's going to be something else. We're going to see things the way the Lord does. Sure, absolutely. We're going to have that fellowship of the Spirit with the Lord. Sure, absolutely. But there's going to be some crying, I believe, at the Great White Throne Judgment, when we see relatives being cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. But don't worry about it, because the Lord's going to wipe away all tears after that event. And we're not going to remember it. The former things are passed away. Whatever you're going through right now, when you hit eternity, it's going to be over. All taken care of. Something else. Let's continue. Verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Let me ask you a real pointed question. Do you believe that you have the true and faithful words of God? I do. I don't believe that I have uh, just a translation. And there are some areas where it could be translated a little bit better and things like this. I believe that this book that I hold in my hands is God's true and faithful words. And I'm going to live accordingly. You say, well, I don't agree with you. Okay, then you live according to what you feel. All right? If I get up there to heaven, I'm going to say, Lord, you know, and the Lord says, oh, you were dumb for being a King James Bible believing Christian. Okay. I'll say, well, I just kind of went with what you showed me here in this book and, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't even make any sense to me. How could you think that, that the Lord is just going to leave us down here with imperfect translations and imperfect copies of copies of copies and whatever else? It's weird. I don't understand how you can take those stands as a Christian and anybody would think, you know, take you seriously. Of course, that's, you know, one of the big reasons why the professing Christian church is such a, in such a shambles now because people don't believe this book anymore. They don't believe that this is the true and faithful word of God. something 
Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you're not aware of this verse, I'll show you this one. This is a really good one. Very important key scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Here's the key to it which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I mean, what kind of witness do you think that you can be to the lost world when you go out there and you say, this is God's word, and in your heart you don't believe it for one minute? You don't believe that this is God's book. You don't believe that this thing is Holy Spirit inspired, and you just go around and you, you're lying to people. You're a hypocrite. Lost world can see that. God's word will not effectually work in your life until you believe it. It's very important to believe it. Go back to Revelation chapter 21. And, you know, people can call me a heretic and a dummy and all this other stuff, not very educated and, you know, King James onlyist and whatever else. That's a small price to pay. I mean, the people that have gone before us to give us this King James Bible um, suffered, tortured, just horrible, horrible things that they've gone through. Christians in other countries that, that don't have the Word of God readily available in communistic countries and things like this, tortured and just persecuted horribly. And I'm, you're worried about somebody calling you a King James onlyist? Have to get that thing fixed up, brethren. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. What is the uh, fountain of the water of life? Hmm. Let's look about that. John chapter 4. Back to the book of John chapter 4. Verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living waters. What did we just read back there in Revelation chapter 21, verse 6? I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Did he offer it to the woman at the well? Yes, he did. Let's keep reading. Verse 11 in John chapter 4. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, or gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will, shall give him um, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That's rather interesting. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. Hmm. He brings up her sin? He doesn't just say, Hey, you asked me. Well, sure, here you go. Brings up her sin. Because he wants to see if she's honest. Verse 17. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman sa saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews." But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. 
Hmm, what are we doing in eternity? Well, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Hmm. So what is the water of, the fountain of the water of life? What is it? Well, that depends on what you believe. Are you here? Or are you with the new versions? Or the Greek scholarship and all the other stuff? What do you believe? Hmm. And what is the condition for belief in this book? The Lord's going to point out your sins. Um, there's an old saying, and that is, this book will keep me from my sins, or this, or my sins will keep me from this book. Very true. That's why a lot of people don't like the book. Because it points out their sins. And you get a new version, and it kind of, you know, takes a little bit easier on the sin, you know? It's like I heard a guy say the one time, you know, it's kind of like you go to, as a Catholic, you go to different priests for different confession type of things, you know, if you're doing something bad then you can go to this one if you're if, you know he's really hard on this other sin well then you go to another priest and yeah you just go and you pick the bible that you want well i prefer the niv in this passage and it, over here i do like the the esv and well this one sometimes i will use the king see what you're doing you are deciding what is the word of god instead of coming to the book and saying no the book will judge me Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, fountain of the water of life freely. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Uh, what is the final time of that presentation of the holy church of God? New Jerusalem? That's when, you know, the church is finally going to be purified completely. Right now we're, you know, stuck to these wicked bodies of sin and we struggle with the sin and everything else. But in eternity... That's all done. Looking forward to it. Okay, back to Revelation chapter 21. We're going to go to verse 7. Okay, it says here, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Okay, now obviously we don't have to overcome to be saved. That's, that's clear for a Bible-believing Christian today. Time of Jacob's trouble, saint in that time period, yeah, they're going to have to overcome a lot of things. All right, but a Christian today, we don't have to overcome. There's no sense of dying in a state of grace or whatever else like the Catholic Church teaches. And a lot of other people that aren't professing Catholics, but they practice Catholicism, uh, the thing of works, salvation, they believe that they have to overcome. Uh, well, good luck with that. <laughs> no, thank you. I'll take the death of Jesus Christ on the cross to pay for my sins. All right, that's where I get in. But uh, notice there that it says, um, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Well, what's going on there? Well, as instruction in righteousness for us today, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Right? That's there for a Christian. We have to overcome in the sense of not giving into the world, not getting messed up by the world, we have to overcome that system of the world to get the inheritance there of, you know, rewards in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, millennial rewards, and whatever else the Lord has planned there. So we have to, you know, we do have to overcome in that sense. Uh, and, you know, again, think of the trade-off that you have here. All right. Um, the Lord says, uh, hey, don't listen to that rock music. It'll mess you up. And it will, and it's pagan in its origin and stuff like that. It exalts the flesh. It has primary emphasis on rhythm. Um, music has three parts to it, because I get this question from people. Why are you so against you know, rock music? Well, because I used to be into it very, very much, and I understand what it does to you. 
Okay, I understand the aggression and, and everything else, you know, of listening to rock music. But there's three parts to music. Harmony, melody, rhythm. Okay, all three parts have to be there. Okay, but if you put primary emphasis on the rhythm and not so much on the harmony and, and melody, you're going to have problems. And you're going to have a exaltation of the flesh because rhythm, the beat, is there and it, it gets the flesh going. All right, and again, you know, scientifically prove that. What do they play in strip clubs? They don't play, you know, philharmonic orchestra music or something like that. What do they play in bars? What do they play in whatever? Fleshly music. Sporting events. Anything like that that they need to exalt that flesh and get the flesh going. They're going to play things with a primary emphasis on rhythm. All right? And the Lord says, hey, don't do that. I don't want you to do that. And you give in to it as a Christian. You're not overcoming the Lord says, hey, I want you to get rid of that. I want you to do, you know, whatever the Lord tells you to do. I mean, we go through a whole list. It doesn't matter. Whatever the Lord tells you to do, if you disobey, you're not overcoming. Therefore, you're not going to, and you don't want to obey because you don't want to suffer for the Lord, you know. You don't want people calling you names and whatever else, you know. You're not going to reign with him. You're not going to be rewarded with the judgment seat of Christ. You're not going to inherit a whole lot of riches in heaven. You have to overcome those things. You have to overcome your fears. You have to overcome the, the doubts that you have and whatever else. You have to fight that stuff. You say, oh man, it sure is hard. You got all of eternity to be rewarded. All right? You know, I mean, we don't even have to look forward to another hundred years here on this earth. It isn't going to last that long. I mean, I'd be surprised if we were here in a few years, you know. Not much time left, brethren. You know? Stick it out, okay? Just kind of, you know, do a little bit more uh, uh, be, be not weary and well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Truer today than it was back when Paul wrote that. But let's continue. Verse 8, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Right there is the most clear, concise verse in the entire Bible as to why people reject Jesus Christ. Why people stay in their sins and never get saved. Right there is the reason. Fearful. Reason number one. They're afraid of what their family is going to think. They're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid of what is my wife going to think? Or, you know, what is, what is this and that? Fearful. I mean, you know, it just, it's so incredible to me. You know, when you understand that God, the creator of the universe, says, Hey, I prepared a place for the devil and his angels. It's a lake of fire where it's pitch black darkness, outer darkness, the Bible calls it where the, the burning never stops. You don't burn up like a lot of the devil worshipers out there are trying to teach today, these false people trying to deny the clear teachings of Scripture. You burn forever, weeping, wailing, gnashing of te teeth. I mean, it's a horrible, terrible place. You'd think that you'd be more afraid of going there in eternity than what your co-workers think of you. But you see, the fearful, the unbelieving. I am a proud atheist. Oh, then you're unbelieving, right? Of course, I don't believe in your fairy tale God. Oh, you will one day. Okay? Fearful, unbelieving, people that refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. The abominable. We sure have some of those today, you know, with uh, Australia just passing the uh, sodomite marriage thing. America's already got it, and most other countries do too. And things, it's an abomination. Laying, man laying with mankind is an abomination. Clear teaching of Scripture. There's no way around that, you know. And you know what? One of the biggest reasons why it's an abomination, because you're killing yourself. Sodomy is murder. You are murdering yourself. So, what are you talking about? Can't have children. You've sterilized yourself. So when you die, you're done. You're not passing anything on to other children. See, unless you go off and you get some kind of thing or whatever, adopt or whatever else. You're sterilizing yourself. You're not appreciating and loving the person that God created you to be. Some woman comes out and she says, I'm not happy with who I am. I'm going to change myself into a man. Why? They don't learn to love 
the fact that God created them to be who they are supposed to be. They don't love themselves. And that's why so many people within the sodomite movement will move into even like sadomasochistic type of stuff where they're, you know, getting into pain and things like this, inflicting pain. They're torturing themselves. It's self-hate. All the diseases and everything else that's rampant out there, the drugs, the alcohol, the anger, everything, you're murdering yourself if you get into sodomy. Sad. It's an abomination. Murderers. Funny how murderers follows the abominable. Hmm. How about that? And of course, I don't need to go into a whole lot about what a murderer is. There's plenty of those out there too. Whoremongers. People basically just fornicating and, and just their life whole their whole life is about fornication and people living together fornicating and things like that, you know, outside of the bonds of, of a biblical marriage, you know, which does not include state marriage licenses. All right, that's not biblical marriage. You won't find a state marriage license in the entire Bible. But side issue. You know. How about sorcerers? Oh, well, I'm not a magician. I'm not a witch or a warlock or some kind of... Uh, but there's different ways to cast spells on people. Some of the neuro-linguistic neuro programming and other things that people do and the way they control and they're manipulative and whatever else. It's a form of sorcery. And, of course, you have pharmacopoeia, you know, the whole drug thing and whatever else. And I could say a whole lot more on that, but I won't for now. But uh, that's a form of sorcery. Chemical sorcery. You can manipulate people's emotions and feelings and attitudes and, you know, whatever through chemicals. And the pharmaceutical drugs are chemicals, by the way. There's nothing good in them. Idolaters. Uh, what is the desire of your heart? What is the thing you, you spend your most time on, your money and whatever else? That's your idol. Yeah, there's a lot of idolaters out there, too. You don't have to be bound down to some little stone idol or something like that. Uh, there's a lot of people that idolize their vehicles or their wealth or their job or whatever. And all liars. Do you ever uh, try to witness to lost people? Are you a sinner? I'm not a bad person. The Bible says there's none good. Uh, so either God's lying or you're lying. I'm not a bad person. That's a lie. God knows your heart. God knows the secrets that you've done, and he understands full well that, yes, you are a bad person. Well, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Well, I don't know. I, I just think that everybody's going to get there on their own good works, and I think I can make it on my own and stuff. Lie number two. Well, the Bible says, eh, the Bible has contradiction. it's contradictions in it. Lie number three. And they go on, and they go on, and they go on, and they go on. I'm a good person. Don't judge me. Blah, blah, blah. And they just keep telling lie after lie after lie after lie to get away from the, the coming judgment. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to have a, a verse that describes anybody that rejects Jesus Christ, you say, why do these people reject Jesus Christ? Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Right there you go. Verse 9, and by the way, I'll say this about verse 8. Uh, notice that all the inhabitants of the lake of fire, none of them are innocent. Think about that. Verse 9, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Hmm. How about an eternal marriage? How about that? You know, talk about a marriage that lasts forever. You know, and isn't it funny how lost people steal so much from the Bible? You know, some some woman and this guy, you know, and stuff, and he's falling in love with her, and he goes, I'll love you forever. <laughs> and like three years later, they're divorced, married to somebody else. You know, uh, where's he getting that from? I mean, it's not possible to to have two people live together on this earth forever. The earth isn't even going to last forever. So why would the guy say, I'll love you forever? You know, De Beers comes out, you know, only a diamond is forever. Funny that they would use a precious stone and say forever. We'll get 
to that here in just a little bit. But isn't that interesting? The lost people, they reject the Word of God, and yet they'll counterfeit the Word of God. They'll use it. Um, you might want to say that, uh, I don't know, uh, God's in control of things. Mm -hmm. The devil can't come up with anything new. All he can do is pervert and twist what God has already created. Keep that in mind. Uh, verse 10, Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Okay, uh, going to be a really neat thing there to see that great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. The point I want to make here real quickly, and then we're going to get to what I'm, the verse tie into this. But the thing of a great and high mountain interesting because towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble you actually have this great earthquake and all the mountains go whoop down like that so the new heaven and the new earth there's mountains there again God flattens them and you know, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble and I believe that there's the agrarian a lot of farming and stuff that goes on during the millennium I think that there's not going to be the big mountains and stuff because mountains are useless you can't grow anything on them for the most part, unless you do raised bed gardens or something like that. There's a lot of rock and stuff in them, rocky soil. Um, but in the Millennial Kingdom, it's just going to be flat and it's going to be a lot of farmland and we'll be able to grow all kinds of good stuff. But in the new heaven and new earth, God's created new mountains. And how much bigger could the new heaven and new earth be? I don't know. Very interesting. But I need to kick something here while I'm on this verse 10 because one of the little posty things that they do, little cute things that they do, is they say, when John is called up, before the time of Jacob's trouble, he's in the spirit. And I've talked about this in other studies, but i got to put this in again, just to kick this nonsense teaching. And they say, see, when John was in the spirit, called up in the spirit, that means it was not bodily, it was just simply his spirit that went up. You know, so they're teaching basically transcendental meditation, or not transcendental, maybe it's astral projection, I think is what I'm thinking of. You know, they're, they're, yeah, it's not meditation. Astral projection. They're you know, out-of-the-body experiences and stuff. The Lord does this for John. You know, it's like, uh, no, no. You see, they're so desperate to cover up the fact that John was called up before the tribulation, tribulation starts. So if even one saint is called up before the tribulation, then the Bible does prove a pre-tribulation rapture. You know, I see they get so desperate. They say, in the spirit just means the spirit and, you know, other guys are walking past John on the Isle of Patmos, and John's just there, you know. His little little sign there says, In the Spirit, be back in, you know, after Revelation 22 is written, you know. I'll be right back. <laughs> Let me show you why it doesn't work. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 22. I'll show you what in the Spirit actually means in the King James Bible, comparing Scripture with Scripture, which posties have no concept of being able to do. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. And at that point, Paul just goes, slumps down on the, on the ground, and, and in Jerusalem there, you know, here comes this ghostly kind of a figure going like this, and he's, and they go, what is that? Well, that's Paul's spirit. He's bound, <laughs> you know, floating through the street. Uh, no. In the Spirit means that he's there, it's the Spirit leading him and things like that. That's what it's talking about. All right? There are certain things the Holy Spirit doesn't have to be there leading you to do. Okay, when I get up in the morning and I want to make some breakfast or something like that, or eat some breakfast, the Holy Spirit doesn't have to be, I'm in the Spirit, you know. No, no. i got to go to the grocery store. Well, the Lord might have a divine appointment for me at that time, and he says, okay, we're going here in the Spirit. You know, the Spirit leading Okay, is what it means. It does not mean out-of-body experiences where the flesh is there, you know, and the spirit someplace else doing something. And how could you have, in Revelation chapter 21, John be in the spirit when he's already in the spirit? So he left his body in the spirit when he got called up to heaven, and then he's up there in the spirit, and then he goes and somehow again gets in the spirit. Kind of interesting. Romans chapter 2. And there's many places we can turn to the thing of the in the spirit 
but I'm just going to show you two of them. Romans chapter 2, verse 28 through 29. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Hmm. Being in the spirit is fellowship with the Lord. Okay? Being there, the Lord's leading you, the Lord's showing you things. That's what being in the Spirit means, okay? When John got called up to heaven in Revelation chapter 4, he was bodily called up. He was not up there, just this spirit entity floating around. Revelation chapter 21, verse 11. And this is an interesting thing. I have to correct a little bit of an error I made the other day. Verse 11, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. Huh. Um, New Jerusalem there, holy Jerusalem. Uh, you know, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. It talks about the, the that great city, the holy Jerusalem. Verse 9, verse 10. So the bride actually has a light we just read about in verse 11 having the glory of God and her light her light was like unto a stone most precious even like a jasper stone hmm who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies what's a ruby it's a red stone I find that rather interesting what's a jasper a red stone and one of you got me in the comments I got to correct an error that I said in my red and green thing, the colors of the throne, and you said, well, you did a good job in the video, and I forget which one of you it was, but you know who you are. And you said, but you're wrong. It doesn't say that the throne is red and green. This is an important tie-in. Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardin stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. He that sat was like a jasper and sardin stone. And the bride of Christ over here, you know, the Lamb's wife, verse 11, her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So the glory of God is red. Hmm, isn't that interesting? And when we are in heaven, we also give off that red light. Isn't it interesting that the devil again counterfeits that? Did you ever hear of the uh, red light district? And the prostitutes, they say to the man that's going to pay them for their fornication, I'm going to take you to heaven, referring to the act that they're going to be doing. Weird, isn't it? So, I correct the error. It's not the throne that was red and green. It's God. He that sat upon the throne is his, the light emanating from God is red. And the throne, behind the throne, there's the green emerald rainbow. Interesting. And the sodomites right now are taking the rainbow, which was given originally as God's judgment, and they're taking the rainbow and putting it all over their stuff. Look, judge us, you know, real smart. Uh, well, God, if you want his collar, the collars of God, there, it's green. The throne, excuse me, the throne is green like a rainbow. There's so much stuff in this book, brethren. I mean, you can read this Bible and, and just study it and study it and study it, and the Lord will show you new things out of the same verses that you've read a hundred times. It's incredible. This King James Bible, there's so much depth to it. That's why I am this. <laughs> You know, not trying to sell t-shirts or anything. Don't get excited. I get, you know, I had a brother send this to me. A dear brother in the Lord and him and his wife. And they, uh, they like the Revelation studies. So here's another one, brother, brother and, and uh, to your wife as well. So, but let's continue. Um, go back to Revelation. Verse 8. We saw in Revelation 4.3. That God's light is red. Revelation chapter 8, 
verse 14. Wait a second here, I have that written wrong. There is no verse 14 in chapter 8. I think I must have got the wrong thing here. Uh, oh, Romans, I'm sorry. It says Romans. I didn't even... <sighs> Just once I'd like to have a perfect infallible sermon. Never do. <laughs> Uh, praise Lord I don't preach perfectly I hate to take any glory from the Lord he gets all the glory for this but uh, Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 verses 14 through 18 for as many as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, you have to overcome, that ye may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What's the glory that's revealed in us? Revelation chapter 21, verse 11, having the glory of God, the glory which shall be revealed in us. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. It's kind of an interesting thing, too, because you have heat lamps. I thought, thinking about this, too, they put off a red light. It's very warming. Hmm. That's what we're going to have for eternity. Living in a city with kind of a soft red glow. And somehow we're going to be emanating that and the glory of God's going to be upon us. Say, so how's that work? I don't know. You know, got to tell a little story. I remember hearing this story about a little boy and, uh, and different children. There was a Sunday school class, you know, and these different children, they were all supposed to say, what, what do you think heaven's going to be like? And, and all these children were saying, well, I think, you know, we'll have, you know, all the, you know, food we can eat. And other oh, I think we're going to have, you know, really neat things that we can do. And we'll, you know, be able to have animals and blah, 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 blah. And they were coming up with all this stuff. And there's this little boy sitting there, kind of quiet. The Sunday school teacher said to him, uh, hey, Jimmy, I don't know what his real name was, but we'll just use that thing. Jimmy, what do you think heaven's going to be like? And he shrugged his shoulders and he said, Jesus is going to be there. That's it. Jesus is going to be there in eternity. He's going to take care of everything. You're not going to get up there and, and be like, this isn't really what I wanted, you know. <laughs> I mean, Jesus is there. He's going to take care of everything. He's got things, you know, I hath not seen, nor ye heard, neither have entered into the heart of the, the, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You know, just quoting from memory there. God's got things worked out. I don't need to understand things here, you know. I don't need to be able to say, I, I, I can see it all. I can understand everything. And the whole book of Revelation just makes perfect sense to me. I can't explain that. And heaven, you're walking around emanating a red light that God does too. We are in him. He is in us. We're all there together. The whole building, you know, joined together. I'm looking forward to it. I can say that. Let's continue. Verse 12. Revelation chapter 21, verse 12. And he had a, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Romans chapter 10. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Twelve tribes of Israel. Romans chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. 
You know, that right there will embody the feeling of any Bible-believing Christian. If you believe this book, if God's Holy Spirit is in you, you will have that desire in your heart for the Jewish people, for the nation of Israel. All this stuff over there in Israel and stuff, I'm still trying to sort out what's going on and things. As Trump comes out and says Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel, okay, I, you know the the whole thing there and the implications. What could that be? And people say the peace treaty between the Jews and Palestinians and and whatever else. I personally think it's going to lead to war, um, you know, real bad war. But we'll see. I, I you know I'm going to be saying some statements on that in the future, but my heart. And my desire is to see Jews get saved. And when I see people coming out and they profess to be Christians and they have a hatred for the Jewish people, this special hatred, this seething hatred, they're not saved. There's a lot of things that you can go back and forth on. Is that, are they saved? Are they lost? Is there some carnality there? Is that, you know, whatever, whatever. The love of the Jewish people is not one of those things. When you see somebody that has a special hatred in their heart for the Jewish people and they're saying they're done, they're finished, God's rejected the Jews, there are, they are no more, God's all done with, you're not dealing with a saved person. Right there, Romans chapter 10 verses 1 through 4, that should be the prayer of every Christian. And when we see a Jew get saved, we should be going, praise the Lord, wow, how neat. And I've seen Jewish people as, as well by the way verse 2 for i bear them record that they have a zeal of god but not according to knowledge you know there's some really zealous jews out there that really want to please god but they don't understand what jesus christ is all about they don't understand they have a zeal of god some of those jews are extremely zealous put christians to shame as far as dedication to something but you ought to think about that when you get to eternity, you're going to be in a city that has 12 gates and the names of the 12 tribes on those gates. But you hate you can hate the Jews. You can hate the nation of Israel and say the 12 tribes are, are, are no more and it's the, the church now. And stuff. Uh, how does that work? I mean, show me in the Pauline epistles or show me anywhere really where Christians are supposed to take the names of the 12 tribes and put them upon ourselves. No, God's not done with the Jews. He's got lots of plans for them in the future. But let's continue. Verses 13 through 14 in Revelation chapter 21. Okay, it says here, On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Jesus had twelve apostles. I do believe that, you know, going back and forth with some of the brethren on this, I believe that, you know, disciples could also be called apostles. Certainly the Lord had a bunch of disciples, so you could say more than just 12 apostles. Uh, different, you know, people that went out and were doing things and, and whatnot. Um, for the Lord, Barnabas, I think, would have been one that would have qualified as a, you know, sort of a disciple slash apostle. But as far as those 12 chosen apostles, um, I believe that it's the 11, Judas Iscariot is out of there, and the Lord chooses Paul as the 12th apostle. All right? Those are the ones that are going to have their names there, there in verses 13 through 14. Um, verse 14, actually, in, in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I believe that that's going to include Paul, not Matthias, in Acts chapter 1, talks about that. I don't believe he was the twelfth apostle. He was their choice, not God's. You know, they cast lots for him and say, you know, show us which one it is. Um, no, God didn't even do anything with Matthias. You never even hear of him again. Paul is the twelfth apostle. So, could other people be called apostles? Yeah, but as far as God's choosing of twelve apostles, um, Paul is the twelfth. Just need to make that point clear. All right, verse 15, Revelation 21, verse 15. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. A golden reed to measure things? You know? Um, go to 1 Kings chapter 10, way back to the Old Testament. I'll show you an interesting thing here. 1 Kings 
chapter 10, 1st and 2nd Samuel, then you have 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. You need to pause the video and, and look stuff up in the index because you're not real familiar with the Bible yet. Well, that's fine. Uh, you can do that. 1st Kings chapter 10, verse 21 through 23. It says here, And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold, none were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. Silver was just like yeah, junk metal, you know. They're drinking out of gold cups. Really something. For the king had at sea a navy of Tharshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tharshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes, and peacocks. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. But what is that compared to eternity? You know, and I'll tell you right now, verse 23 has never been overthrown. King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. No king has ever had the wealth that Solomon had. You say, well, there's, you know, the Rothschilds and the, you know, all these other big families and stuff like this. They got lots of money. It's computer money. It's generated money, funny money, printed stuff that they, you know, Federal Reserve notes and whatever else. That's not real money. Show me these guys laying hold on the kind of, you know, precious metals, precious stones, everything else that, that Solomon had. They can't even get close to it. That's why the Freemasons revere Solomon, King Solomon. And, of course, because he got messed up by his strange wives and they got him into all kinds of you know, occult practices and worship and stuff, which there you have the seal of Solomon, which is on the star, you know, that they call the star of David. It's actually the seal of Solomon. It's an occult thing, the star of their god Moloch. You know, the Bible talks about it. It is a pagan symbol. And the Jews right now are under God's judgment. That's the reason for the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, go over that and over that and over it. Some people don't get it. But you have the richest man ever lived on the earth, and they're drinking out of gold. How about in eternity, they're measuring things with gold. You're going to be pretty wealthy. You know, say, oh, we got a golden reed here. We'll just measure with this. Just thought that was kind of an interesting little thing there. But let's look at verse 16. There's something very, very interesting here I'm going to share with you. Verse 16. And the city lieth four square. One, two, two, three, four. City lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Okay? Now, we're going to do some math here. All right? This is quite telling. Because we are talking about the, the city, New Jerusalem, where we are going to be for all of eternity. As, as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, you know, we're going to be there for all of eternity. How big is this city? One furlong is an eighth of a mile. Okay, so there are eight furlongs in one mile. So if you take 12,000 furlongs and divide it by the number eight, eight furlongs in one mile, you come out to 1,500 miles. So this city is 1,500 miles long. And that way, and that way, and this way. So it's a huge square that's 1,500 miles on each side. Okay, four square, 1,500 miles. That's huge. And if you multiply 1,500 by 1,500, you get 2,250,000 square miles. All right? Now, one square mile is equivalent to 640 acres. So if you take 2,250,000 square miles and multiply that times 640, you come up with 1,440,000,000 acres of land. 1,440,000,000 acres is how big New Jerusalem is. It's a little bit of land. I find it interesting, too, that it works out to 1,440 because in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, it says that there's 144,000 sealed Jews. Hmm. On the 12 gates that go around this city, 
Because you think 12 gates, boy, that must be a lot of gates around. The, well, not when it's uh, 1,500 miles on each side. <laughs> you know, having, you know, uh, what would that be, three gates on each side? Yeah, we read about that uh, verse 13 on the east, three gates on the north, three gates, you know, so on and so forth. Three gates in 1,500 miles? <laughs> okay, uh, you could probably got to do some walking between gates. You know what I mean? Uh, that's pretty incredible. But I find it interesting. It works out to 144 or 1 billion 440 million acres of land. Just 144. Same thing as the 12 tribes, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. 144,000. Hmm. Now here's the where it gets interesting. Revelation chapter 5 verse 11 gives the number of angels as 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. I talked about this in the study on that. So you have 10,000 times 10,000 is basically 100 million and then thousands of thousands. All right. So we're going to go to the absolute extreme and that is we'll go with 200 million. Now it can't be 200 million because then it would be, you know, not 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So it has to be a number less than 200 million. All right. But let's just say 200 million. Now, if you take uh, 1 billion 440 million acres in New Jerusalem, okay, 1,500 miles, 1,500 miles, 1,500 miles, 1,500 miles, and all the land that's in there, and you take 200 million saints, okay, and you divide up that 1 billion 440 million acres, that would give each saint 7.2 acres. Of land okay now the interesting thing about that is that you have the King James Bible Jesus says uh, it's in uh, John 14 verse 2 it says the King James Bible we'll go there in just a minute the King James Bible says in my father's house are many mansions the NIV says in my father's house are many rooms so if each saint gets 7.2 acres of land just to prove my point here, um, how do you get a 7.2 acre room? I don't think so. You know, you get weird stuff that these new version people come up with. Uh, no, that's actually 7.2 acres. And you could, you know, I was raised on, I think, six and a half acres of land, and we had, you know, it was a pretty nice, you know, place to grow up and things. Um, so you could have a mansion and some acreage around it. Okay, you're not going to have a mansion that covers 7.2 acres. You know, that's a pretty decent amount of land. But there's one thing I left out. The 1,440,000,000 acres of land is a two-dimensional measurement. That's just 1,500 miles, 1,500 miles on both sides, 1,500 miles here, and the square mile thing and the count there. What we read there... Verse 16, the height of it are equal. It goes 1,500 miles up that way, too. Wait a second. This city is not only this way, 1,500 miles square this way, it also goes up 1,500 miles. How big are these mansions going to be? I mean, even if you just had a two-dimensional city, you know, just one level, and it's just 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500, you still got 7.2 acres, conservatively 7.2 acres for each one of the saints. But then you go up. And at that point, my brain starts to hurt, and I say, okay, I'm not going to try to calculate anymore. <laughs> you know, uh... Yeah, going to be interesting. Verse 17, Revelation 21, verse 17. And he measured the wall thereof in hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. Hmm. Two points. There are no female angels in the entire Bible. Not one verse. Okay. Number two. No wings on any angels in the Bible. You'll never see that. Cherubim? Yes. Seraphim? Yes. Angels, not one mention of that. 
So this time of the year when you see the angels and stuff, you know, the, the nativity scenes and the, you know, the angels are coming down or blowing the trumpet, you know, and they got the big old feathered wings on the back. You're not looking at an angel. It's important to understand that. Go back to the book of Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. If you haven't seen this verse, I'm going to give you this one because this is an interesting thing. Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for, look at this, thereby some have entertained angels unawares. But no, no, that's not correct, because if, if you know you get some stranger come along and, and he's an angel, you're going to see his feathered wings. A little hard to conceal that, wouldn't it? They don't have wings. And, uh, you know, I will say that I've had a few experiences, one in particular, that I believe the guy was an angel. And, you know, weird, weird, weird thing. And, uh, again, it's not like, oh, oh, really? Oh, you know, stuff. Why would you want to go after angels and stories of angels and things like so many people do? And, and there's a big whole cult following of this thing. I've seen angels. I believe in angels and stuff like this. Well, I do, too. I do believe that there's angels that walk around on the earth, you know, as regular-looking men. Um, certainly. But you can have a personal relationship with their boss. Jesus Christ. Why waste time with the servants of the Lord? <laughs> Weird. But uh, back to Revelation chapter 21. Verse 18 through 21. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. And the foundation of the wall of the city were garnished, uh, foundations, excuse me, of the wall of of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth a beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Hmm. Very interesting. Be right back. I just got to grab something over here. Grab the bring it over. Now, I realize that what we just read there was too archaic. You can't possibly understand that. I mean, you know, what is what's gold? We don't know what that is. And a lot of these other things here, we you know, we don't know what that is. So, I'm going to really do all of you a favor out there today. I'm going to read from the NIV. These same verses. Revelation chapter 21. Follow along in your King James Bible and you'll see how much more uh, clear this is. Emphasis on the clear there. A little sarcasm here, brethren. Revelation 21. Let's start there in verse 18. Reading here from the NIV. And remember, the NIV, all that they're trying to do, according to their you know, stated purpose is update the archaic language of the King James Bible. Not make a new Bible, just, you know, new with new, whole new words and stuff. Just the archaic language. That's what we have to do. Make it more understandable. Show you that that's not true. Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 18. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. Wait a second. Um, glass is not as pure as gold. If you get 0.999 gold or whatever else, uh, that goes through a lot more purifying process than the glass in your window or your car windshield or something like that. You see how they change the Word of God into a lie? Pure gold like unto, trans like unto glass. You know, yeah, the city was, a pure, was pure gold like unto clear glass. It doesn't say, the King James Bible does not say as clear as glass. It's just like unto glass. It's saying this pure gold is clear. That's what it's saying. It's not saying that the, the gold is the same purity as, your, as the glass in your window or something like this. Ridiculous. But now watch how the NIV, they literally will change four of the stones. So the NIV, New Jerusalem, where there are rooms, 
You know, I'll show you that here in just a minute. The NIV New Jerusalem is different than the King James Bible New Jerusalem. Let's see about that. Verse 19. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, hmm. the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, it's the third one that they've changed, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth barrel, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. They did it again. Isn't that interesting? Four of the stones are different in the NIV. They've changed four of the stones in the city where Christians are going to be. But they're just updating the archaic, archaic language. No, they're giving you a different Bible altogether. And there's many, many places where the NIV totally changes the text. And we're not talking well interpretation. I'm talking, you know, uh, just totally changing the whole meaning. Why? It's not from the Lord. Turn to John 14, verse 2. If you've never heard of this thing. John 14, verse 2, in your King James Bible. John chapter 14, verse 2. King James Bible. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. NIV. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? So if you are an NIV user, you go to a city that has different uh, stones in it, and it's not pure gold that's clear. No, it's just gold that is as pure as the glass that you have in your window, and you get a room. If you want to use that, uh, go right ahead. But this isn't God's word. This is junk. And I like to throw junk out. Okay. Revelation chapter 21. Let's continue here with our study. Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, well, it wasn't, that's right, it, I'm forgetting things. Because, see, the temple wasn't built yet. When the Bible's done, that's when all the temple building happened. Duh. <laughs> you know, they didn't have temples in the first century. They didn't have church buildings, but they did after that. Okay? And John, you know, he's there in eternity, and, and you know, after the Bible's written, then God's like, okay, let's, let's start, you know, putting fundraisers together to raise the money for a church building. <laughs> and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. I've often thought about this, you know, it's like, the Lord says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Um, I'm in Christ all the time. I'm in the church all the time, wherever I go. What a wonderful promise. But these people that worship their church buildings out there, they're not in church all the time. It's going to be in church. Amen. You mean you're not other times? You're not before you come to the building? Oh, now, brother, why don't you read the Bible and stick with what the Bible says? But God's going to bless you. Okay? God's going to bless you because you defend things that don't appear in the Scriptures and you cut on those that want to follow the Scriptures. And it isn't, oh, oh, well, you're just trying to do things like they did in the first century. You don't ride around in a chariot, do you, and blah, blah. We're talking, this is the teaching of Scripture. It's not there in the first century. It's not there all throughout church history among Bible-believing Christians. And it's not there in eternity. I think God's trying to say something. I don't think God likes the thing of a building being there for people to come into to worship and you do your little special thing on Sunday. And the rest of the week you get to live like the devil. You might want to consider that, brethren. Verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. 
the red light. Hmm. Verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. You know what I think is a glorious thing? When I see nations in their traditional kindred you know, outfits and things like this and their unique music and things like that, I think that, that is one of the most holy things that there is. People celebrating and saying, I'm in Germany, I'm going to wear traditioner, traditional lederhosen and trocht and dirndl and all the other things, and I'm going to you know, play the traditional music and things of my people. You look over in England, they're dressed in their traditional clothing. You look in Africa, they're dressed in their traditional clothing. You look at Japan, they're dressed in their traditional clothing. I think that that's going to be there in eternity. Maybe a little bit different, whatever else. But it doesn't say that they bring the glory of God into the city of, Jer of New Jerusalem there. Look at the verse. Uh, verse 24. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Verse 26. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. God wants diversity. God wants people to be separated. When all the people come together and say, we're one, we're one, we're new world order, we're all coming together. We need to come together to fight the common evil. That's not of the Lord. Integration has never been God's system. God wants segregation. He wants purity. He wants people to be separate. I mean, does God want integration between the saved and the lost? No. He wants us to segregate ourselves, to separate ourselves. Why? To preserve the beauty. I, don't, I just I don't understand how people can't see that. You know, I get called a racist and a bigot and all this other stuff. Racists are people that want to destroy certain people. I don't want that. Integration is what destroys culture. Segregation preserves it. But you got it figured out. You're gonna, you know, you got some special little thing there and stuff like that, and you're gonna be, you know, you have a rough time. Some of these people that call themselves Christians, if they're actually saved. They're sure going to have a rough time in heaven. Kind of weird. Verse 27. And this is another one you just kind of smile and go, Oh, Lord, <laughs> even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's get this thing going. I can't wait for this. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, I was talking with a sister this morning about this, and she said, you know, the thing of Christmas, she's like, you know, it's it's pretty to see the lights and everything else. And and uh, some of the music is, you know, they're playing, uh, you know, Joy to the World or Hark the Herald Angels Sing or, you know, other things about Jesus, you know. And, and that's neat, but it's like then it's poisoned by the Santa Claus and by the reindeer and all the other stuff. And you're just going, uh, you know, <laughs> and the vexation of that stuff and the, the covetousness and everything. Um, not so in eternity. When we get to eternity, there isn't going to be any of that other stuff to defile things. You know, you're not going to be like, oh, nuts, i got to go down this street. There's that bar down there. They always play that music when I go past, you know. Nope, not in heaven. Not in that city that we're going to be living in for all of eternity. There isn't going to be any Catholic church to vex us or, you know, whatever else. It's going to be wonderful. All of eternity. Finally, turn to Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to give you a real good challenge, leave you with a good challenge here, brethren. Um, you know, there's a, just use this as an example. The Bible talks about uh, running the race that's before us. Paul gets to the end of his life and he says, I have, you know, finished my course, run the race, you know, and things like that. Looking unto the Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, Jesus is at the finish line. You're running towards him. Okay. Um, what do you do when you're running a race? Or rather, I should say, preparing for running the race. You stay in practice. Okay? You stay in good shape. Well, uh, we can look and see what is going, going to be in eternity in Revelation chapter 21. I think we should get into practice for it right now. It's not going to hurt. Um, there's not going to be anything in that city that's going to defile. How about in your life, Christian? Do you have things in your life that are kind of uh, defiling you? 
defiling your walk with the Lord? Let's look at some challenging verses here. Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 through 17. Let's read these verses. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Very true for the body of Christ. Uh, it doesn't matter what you are. Sex, male or female, you know, uh, race, whatever. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Now in eternity... You know, it's a different story. The nations that are saved and things like that are going to bring their glory and honor into, you know, New Jerusalem. But we're all one in Christ. Again, dispensational difference there. But let's continue. Verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Practice. Practice for eternity. You say, well, brother, Brian, that's a kind of a rough list there. Things that do, you know. Uh, there's things that, that are vexing and whatever else down here. And, and you know, yeah, sure. But you always got to come back to that. And you got to say, you know what? You know, I'm not going to waste my time with these lost people. If they've rejected and they don't want to hear and the Lord's not opened up a door of opportunity to witness to them and whatever else, let them alone. I said in my one study, let them alone. They'd be blind leaders of the blind. Forget about it. You know, what are you doing to encourage the body of Christ? Are you helping other Christians? I have to ask myself these questions. Am I really doing very good at those verses? It's a challenge. And that's what I'm going to leave you with this week. It's a little challenge. Go through those verses and say, how am I doing? How much peace of God do I have in my heart? We're running a race, brethren. There's not much time left. Okay? So that is going to be it for Revelation chapter 21. One more chapter to go. Revelation chapter 22. And then we will be done with these studies. Um, really enjoyed doing this. You know, these different studies and things. The Lord certainly has showed me a lot. Certainly has challenged me a lot. And I hope that you have been encouraged and, and challenged as well. And um, so I think that's going to be it for now. Um, like I said, we got one more to do, Revelation chapter 22. Uh, a lot of other projects and things on kind of the back burner right now. I'm trying to get this stuff done. I've, I've you know, I tend to kind of work a little bit faster than my videos come out. And I'm trying to get, stop doing that and trying to, when I do sermon notes, Try to bring the sermon out and then work on the next project. So, uh, just telling you a little bit of how that this whole thing works. But um, I really just hope that uh, that you've been encouraged by this. It's been a great encouragement to me. And uh, you know, I'm still trying to sort out this whole thing with this Israel thing. Uh, just just tell you real quick here what my thoughts on it are. Um, I don't see this peace treaty between the Jews and the Palestinians in Scripture. Uh, the confirm, you know, Daniel 9, 27, he confirms the covenant with many for one week. Where does it say peace treaty between Jews and Muslims? I don't see that. Jews and Palestinians, whatever you want to say. Um, where's that? I don't see it. Uh, by peace he shall destroy many. Um, so, and I know this speech by Donald Trump, he's like speaking, he's talking about peace and security and all this other stuff, and people are going, oh, this is it, you know, it's going to lead to the tr treaty the Antichrist is going to sign and all this other stuff. We're going, we're going to be leaving at the rapture. I don't know. There could be a massive war with Islam, and uh, that could be part of this confirming the covenant thing. Uh, they, you know, 
a theory that I have, and, and it's just a theory. I'm not saying that this is definitely what's going to happen. It's going to lead to violence, this whole thing of Jerusalem, and then they're going to move the embassy to Jerusalem and stuff, you know, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Um, it, it will lead to violence. There's no question about that. It's just a boiling pot. You know, the Bible talks about it being a cup of trembling. And it's going to lead to a violent thing and whatever else. It could trigger World War Three or something. We'll see. I don't know. Um, but I think that it could be, you know, I find it funny that the Pope, you know, has decried what Trump has done and said basically that they hope that the city of Jerusalem doesn't go under Israeli control. I found that kind of interesting, you know, because you get a Jesuit Pope, Francis, and Trump is a trained Jesuit as well from Fordham University. So it's kind of like, hmm, you know, could it be kind of a good cop, bad cop type of deal where Trump comes in and does this thing and it triggers a war and stuff that's going to destabilize the peace process, all these people are saying. And it leads to war. Muslims, you know, could be part of the thing of the Muslims getting slaughtered, another crusade from Roman Catholicism. And um, and then the Pope can step in and say, look, we got to do something to, you know, now that things have really kind of, you know, we need to calm things down a little bit here. And, and uh, we need to come in here and, and we will, since Islam's pretty much wiped out, we'll uh, make an agreement here between Israel and the new world religion, which is going to be Roman Catholicism. Um, just my theory. So we'll see what happens. Either way, it's a major prophetic thing that happened here yesterday or whatever it was. Uh, very, very major. And uh, it does point to the rapture getting a lot closer. So uh, there's not much time left. So what suffering you're going through right now, what anxiety or whatever else, uh, just... Tough it out, brethren. There's not much time to go. So that is going to be it. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next study.